there we go. See, there, there, there was the glitch we needed to start a webinar, right? You always need one. Um, so once again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, those of you who are on the Zoom webinar uh, and those of you who are joining us on the county planning page uh, on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Arthur Schmidt. I'm a senior planner with OHM Advisors. Uh, I'm going to uh, be your uh, quote unquote host for the evening uh, as we go through our uh, second virtual workshop here for the Community Confluence uh, TLCI. Um, before we get started with um, uh, some opening remarks, uh, introducing our panelists and then uh, going through our presentation, <clears throat> I just wanted to go through some uh, some housekeeping items here uh, with respect to uh, Zoom. So for those of you who are on the Zoom platform, um, what you can do to interact with us throughout the presentation today, throughout this uh, workshop, um, the different functions. Uh, so very quickly, you will see that at the bottom of your screen, your phone, your tablet, um, your computer device, uh, you'll see a toolbar uh, with a couple of functions on there. These are the functions you'll, you, you will use uh, to participate this evening in the webinar and to interact uh, with myself and the rest of the panelists. Um, down at the bottom, you see a little chat function. Um, this is going to allow you to send messages um, to all of the panelist members here. Um, so if you, uh, you can use this if you have a question or a comment um, or uh, if there's something you want clarification on, um, you can use the chat function and we'll be able to see that and address your questions. The other way that you can interact with us is uh, raise your hand. Um, so at the bottom of the uh, toolbar again, uh, there'll be a function where you can request to uh, ask a question live. Um, I will receive a notification and once we have a moment uh, that we can bring you on to um, ask the question, uh, you will see this uh, little mark, uh, this little pop-up come up to say that I would ask you to unmute your microphone. You'll be able to unmute your microphone and then ask your question live to the, to the panelists. And then the third and final way that you can participate with us um, this evening is through the question and answer um, function down at the bottom. So this is going to allow you to ask questions to, to our team of panelists here. Uh, you can type your question into the box and then we'll either respond within the question box or we'll respond, we will respond live to you. For those of you who are joining us on the County Planning Facebook page uh, through the Facebook Live function, uh, once again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who are watching here, uh, you will see it should be on the right hand side. Uh, if you're watching it on your uh, screen or your tablet, uh, there's a comment section. If you're watching it on your phone, it's just below uh, the video screen. Uh, you can submit your questions uh, within the comment section. Uh, we will be able to see those questions and comments in here and we'll bring those, raise those questions up to uh, the panelists as we go uh, through, this, uh, through this workshop here. So through the, through the chat function, through the Q&A, through the raising your hand, for those of you on Facebook Live, uh, uh, putting in uh, a comment in the comment section, you'll be able to interact with us. Um, like I said, our agenda this evening, go over a quick overview uh, of the project, introduction of our project team uh, members who are with us here on the panel, and then uh, go through our, our presentation that was up on the project website uh, for the past week now, um, and then we'll go into the Q&A section. Um, so with that, uh, let me kick it off first by um, asking all of our panelists to say hi, wave, introduce themselves, and and I'll, I will, I will in, introduce everyone and bring everyone up since everyone can't see who's in the row that I can. Uh, so let me kick it off first with Kristen. Kristen, why don't you introduce yourself and say hi. Hi, my name is Kristen Saunders and I am with Tool Design Group um, and I am a transportation planner working on some of the bike, bicycle and pedestrian components of this project. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Jim, you're next on my screen. Hi, I'm Jim Sonhalter, Manager of Planning Services for Cuyahoga County Planning Commission. Thank you, Jim. Kelly, you're next up for me. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Kelly Kaufman. I'm a, a park planner with Cleveland Metro Parks. Rich? Hi, I am Rich Snyder. I am the Director of Public Safety Service for the City of Rocky River. Uh, Kathy, let's go next. I am Kathy Fromet with Guide Studio, and uh, we are providing wayfinding consulting uh, for this project. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Melissa, you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Thompson. I'm the Active Transportation uh, Planning Manager at NOACA. Thanks, Melissa. And then we also have Marguerite Novak, uh, who's part of the OHM team, who is uh, taking our our meeting minutes and, and video minutes, I don't know if you call meeting minutes or video minutes now, um, and, and scribing everything down for us. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Marguerite. 
Um, so with that, I'm actually going to hand it back over uh, to Jim uh, to give kind of just a brief introduction uh, of our project before we kick off our presentation. So Jim, take it away. All right. Thank you, Arthur. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our second uh, virtual community workshop for the Community Confluence Plan. Uh, this work is funded by a grant uh, from the Northeast Ohio Area-Wide Coordinating Agency, NOACA, uh, through its Transportation for Livable Communities Initiative Program. So uh, County Planning is thrilled to partner with the cities of Lakewood and Rocky River, Cleveland Metro Parks, and NOACA to improve active transportation. And these are the experiences of walking and bicycling all through this area. And it's truly a confluence of cities and metro parks and where neighborhoods come together. And it's an area that sees people outside every day walking and cycling. So you're gonna hear from tonight from our talented and experienced uh, consultant team, OHM Advisors, Tool Design Group, Guide Studio, and Lucas Engineering. And together we're all working to craft an achievable active transportation plan. There's already a lot of work underway and much that we're exploring through this planning process. And I wanna thank our partners, our consultant team, and everyone who's taken the time to share their ideas through the surveys, phone calls, and emails to us. And back to you, Arthur. Thank you, Jim. That was like a perfect radio, radio snippet right there. I like that, that was great, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna go through just a, a quick part of our presentation here this evening uh, before we get to the Q&A session. Um, before we begin here, I just want to, to make a comment that um, as um, Kristen, Kathy, and myself are going through the presentation here, um, please feel free to submit your questions um, in the Q&A function um, as we're going through. Um, so that way, once we get to the Q&A section, we can begin to uh, address them. So please don't feel shy to uh, submit your questions as we're going through this presentation. So that way you don't forget uh, uh, your question once we get to that period. Uh, and the same for those of you who are watching us on the County Planning Facebook page through Facebook Live, uh, please submit your questions um, and comments in the comment section as we're going through this presentation. And like I said, once we get to that Q&A session, uh, we'll begin to address those as we go through. So with that, uh, I wanna kick off the presentation uh, portion here. Um, and just quickly kind of give you a high level overview of where we're at right now uh, with respect to the project, uh, where we were and where we're heading. Um, so right now we're, we're kind of in this middle kind of phase three, phase four, uh, where we are beginning this, this second round of, of community engagement here virtually. Um, this was a project that, that kicked off post pandemic. So our first round of community engagement was also done virtually. Um, and that was through a series of, of videos and presentations uh, and surveys and a lot of those results you're going to, a lot of those results in the work uh, you're going to see here at the beginning and part of our presentation. Um, and that was all being hosted and done through uh, the county planning's uh, website. Uh, we had a project page up, everyone was able to see the videos, see the presentations uh, and take the surveys. And for those of you who participated uh, in that first workshop, either uh, by watching the videos, submitting your comments or questions, um, uh, taking the surveys, seeing the flyers out uh, around the trails, uh, thanks to our, our partners at Cleveland Metro Parks who, who helped put those uh, flyers uh, out there. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your participation in that first part. And again, appreciate your participation in the second part as well. So again, as I talked about, we had that first com uh, virtual community workshop uh, from uh, about June 11th uh, through the July 4th holiday. Uh, a series of, of surveys, series of videos. Um, we had multiple flyers out uh, both on the trails uh, and with some of the area-wide businesses. Uh, had the opportunity to, to call in uh, your comments and, and questions um, uh, through uh, the Cleveland Metro Parks uh, phone line there. Um, so just a, a great amount of participation by everyone and we're, we're very grateful for that. And it's been incredibly helpful uh, as we're going through this process. So very quickly, we wanna go through some of those results so you can kind of understand where we started from and how we've built up to, to the recommendations uh, that some of you have seen uh, through the project website. And then uh, for maybe some of you, the first time you're gonna see tonight that um, Kristen, Kathy, and myself are going to go through. So with respect to um, the, the survey, we had about 188 responses. Um, and for those of you who took the survey, we asked you to pick out uh, from these 12 segments, um, answer a series of questions. Just under, understanding your comfort level uh, with respect to being a cyclist, being a pedestrian, being a motorist, right? Working on the, you know, running on the trails, just trying to get an understanding of, of how you felt um, uh, within those segments. And very quickly, um, just kind of an overarching look at, at the feedback we heard. Um, this map right here kind of shows the intensity. Uh, so the darker and thicker the red line, uh, the more comments uh, that we received for that particular segment uh, within the study area. 
So you can see here on the map and, and through the, the chart on the left uh, that Riverside Drive, uh, Valley Parkway, uh, Detroit Avenue, uh, those were the three big, uh, those were the three sections that received the most comments uh, about them, um, whether it regard to, to safety, how people were feeling using the facilities uh, within those sections and so on and so forth. So, um, so as you can see, those three sections were the top on, on the bottom end, Hilliard, Booster Road, uh, and Park Loop Trail, those were segments 10, 5, and 7, uh, received the, the least amount of comments. Still important, um, this is not to say that uh, not all the comments uh, were, were critical, but it just helps to show where a lot of the energy, where a lot of the community was focused on uh, with respect to uh, the survey results. And now to kick it, I'm going to kick it over to Kathy uh, to talk over uh, some of the wayfinding survey results that we received. All right, so the wayfinding survey, it's, an, it's a survey to help inform how we look at wayfinding, but really it informed us a little bit on how uh, people were intending to use, um, how they currently use the area and how they would feel about uh, a more connected network um, that would allow them to feel comfortable and safe um, biking and walking um, in the study area. So this first slide is just going through the demographics. This was an online survey that was pushed out through the website on social media. We had 45 respondents and 66 of those um, have actually lived, um, are residents of the area and 42 have lived there for over 10 years. Um, what we asked them was how far, one of the questions we asked them initially was how far are you willing to walk or bike? within the area and everybody said that they were willing to go over two miles. <laughs> so that's great and it means that people are up for the task of using um, a, a system um, that would allow them to connect between communities and uh, amenities. Um, we also asked them questions about how they were currently using and you know walking and biking in the area. Um, the majority of them were doing this for leisure and exercise. If you forward Arthur. Um, and then we asked them, you know, what kind of benefits um, would you see if you had a well-connected and well-maintained pedestrian bike route path um, in your community? And overwhelmingly, they felt it would also increase their use from an outdoor recreation perspective. Um, it would allow them to have um, better access to city parks and amenities, um, access to other regional trails. Um, and they felt that it would also improve safety and increase focus on sustainability. So people did, they had um, a high degree of interest in uh, having well-maintained and well-connected um, bike and walking paths. Some of the concerns that they have for, um, I think any time when you're asking for uh, multiple modes of travel to converge together, safety is always um, on everybody's mind. So this was probably their biggest concern with this, um, and then second to that is too much vehicular traffic, and then um, right below that, cost and maintenance, but really safety is, is always um, first and foremost for people when they're thinking about um, multiple modes of travel. Some of the tools for success. So we asked them how important did they think certain elements would be to make sure um, that this uh, amenity and asset would be well used. Um, signage and maps, um, having it be accessible to all abilities, lighting, bike shares and bike parking, and also traffic signals and control. So again, that safety factor um, is pretty critical for everybody. And then the outcomes, like the last question that we asked was if you were, if there was a safe connected pedestrian bike path within this study area, how often would you or your children use them compared to the current use? And there was an increase um, compared to how they were using it now and how they would use it um, if these amenities were put in place and if this work was done. So I think that was a pretty interesting outcome of the wayfinding analysis. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. And now, um, before I kick it over to, to Kristen to talk um, the start of our network completion and alternatives, uh, again, just want to remind those of you who are on the Zoom webinar um, that as we go through these slides, um, if you have questions, feel free to submit them through the Q&A function or through the chat function. And those watching on Facebook Live on the County Planning 
uh, Facebook page um, to also submit your question, excuse me, submit your questions uh, through the comment section um, as we go through these sections. So Kristen, I'm gonna kick it over to you um, to, to go over this next section. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the type of facilities we looked at and kind of where we are um, looking at, you know, installing them or at least creating schematic designs for some of these projects uh, throughout the project area. So there are many, you know, just a little background, there are many design guides out there for the design of bicycle and pedestrian facilities and they have, you know, seen a, an enormous amount of innovation and updates over the last decade. And I, you know, as someone who works in this industry, I've really been following this closely, um, but some of the ones that we really use um, are the National, National Association of City Transportation Officials, or NACDO, the Urban Design Guide. Um, there's many different guides for, from the FHWA at a um, nationwide level. And then I also wanted to mention that ODOT is the Ohio Department of Transportation is also creating their own multimodal specific design guide um, that's going to come out in the next couple of years. And these are really, really useful, um, you know, for informing people, but also ensuring that uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities have some consistency, you know, across the state, across the city, and across the nation. So when you when you see a line on Google Maps that says there's a bike lane there, you know a little bit more about what that means. You know, it's not gonna be a two foot little you know, shoulder next to a really busy road. So we're, I think we're working together nationwide to really add some consistency to what bicycle and pedestrian accommodation means. Next slide, please. Um, and then one of the most difficult tasks when you're doing this work is really choosing what type of facility to put on a specific road. Um, and one of the most concise guides that I use, um, and I think a number of people use, was published in 2019. Um, and it's the FHWA Bikeway Selection Guide. And that kind of helps you choose facility types for the, road, the specific road condition. So it doesn't tell you how wide to make a bike lane. It tells you whether, you whether you should be thinking about a bike lane or a protected bike lane or a shared use path, sort of a uh, trail. Um, so that's a really good guide, it's pretty short. And that guide um, specifically is catered towards, is really built on the idea of all ages and abilities. Um, so that guy tells you, so sort of, this is a, um, the idea that everyone is some type of cyclist. Everyone sort of fits in this spectrum of people who may or may not ride a bike and may or may not feel comfortable in different kind of conditions. Um, and sort of the categories that we, we use um, as a tool to kind of think about this work is um, interested but concerned, somewhat confident and highly confident. And highly confident cyclists are the people that you see out on any road where you're like, oh my gosh, why is someone riding a bike there? Um, <laughs> where you see out on any road, they feel very, very comfortable in motor vehicle traffic. Um, and they're already out there. They're already biking all over the city. Um, the somewhat confident cyclist, which is where I would probably um, fit a little more in this category, where I, I feel comfortable sharing the road with motor vehicles at some times, but I feel much more comfortable on a busy street with a bike lane. Um, and if I'm caught on a busy street without a bike lane, I can do it, but I don't really like it. And then a much larger proportion of people really fit into the interested in but concerned category, which is people that are interested in cycling, might try it, but are concerned for their safety and really only feel comfortable when they're on a trail or in something called a separated bike lane, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, or on a really, really low traffic street. And there is a fourth category, um, if anyone did the math, this doesn't add up to 100%. Um, there is a fourth category and that's just people who are not going to bike. They are unable or uninterested in biking. And that is um, totally reasonable and that is a fourth category. But what we've found you know, across the nation over the last decade in doing these type of surveys is that a significant proportion of people are really interested in biking but concerned for those safe, their safety. So when we talk about you know, goals of getting more people on a bike, we really have to build bike lanes that feel comfortable to people with families and people carrying cargo and things like that. Um, so we're gonna launch a little poll um, just to get an idea of kind of where you fit. And maybe you've never thought about this before and this is an interesting exercise for you. Um, so yeah, Arthur. So this is asking which category you feel um, 
you fit into. Um, so that's strong and fearless. I'm comfortable on a bike on most streets and I'm comfortable sharing a road with a motor vehicle. Um, I am enthused and confident. I'm comfortable riding a bike on streets with bike lanes and most sort of slower neighborhood streets. Um, interested but concerned. I'm only comfortable riding bikes on trails. And then no way, no how. I'm unable and uninterested. Um, so I'm actually going to answer as well. And while this poll, uh, Kristen, while you're doing that, while this poll is up for our Zoom webinar uh, individuals, for those of you who are on Facebook Live, uh, we'd still like to hear your answers uh, through the comment section. Um, so as Kristen was uh, indicating, um, the question was asking, what type of cyclist are you? Um, and four options are strong and fearless, enthused and confident, interested but concerned, and no way, no how. Um, so you can also uh, participate with those uh, uh, questions um, in the Facebook Live comment section. So once again, what type of cyclist are you? Uh, and the options are strong and fearless, enthused and confident, interested but concerned, or no way, no how. Um, and I do see some, and maybe, um, can you see how many people have responded on your end? Yes, we just have uh, just one folk, one individual hasn't responded. That's probably me because I gave that yeah. to the panelists and yeah, I can't yeah. do it at the same time. So um, I, think we have I just, I do see your questions coming in um, and they are quite specific and I'm, we are going to get into a little more specific. So maybe I'll continue on the presentation and we'll come back to those questions if they are un, unanswered. Um, but I'll try to answer those as we move through the next couple of slides. So just to walk through, um, Arthur, I don't know if you have the ability to share that poll, actually. I will work on that while you are okay. going through the next slide. Um, so. Just to walk through a, a quick overview of the type of facilities out there and um, be thinking about where you've seen these in the study area, um, because I'm going to ask you where you like to bike. So, um, so the one, you know, the first, the sort of, uh, most protected bike facility where most people feel comfortable is a shared use path and you have a ton of these in the Rocky River Reservation. Um, next slide. And then one, um, the next sort of level of bike facility is a cycle track, which is also can be called a protected bike lane or a separated bike lane. Um, and these can be one way or two way. And they really try to bring that user experience that everyone loves on a trail to streets. So you um, have, and the difference between these and a regular bike lane is that element of vertical, vertical separation. So in this uh, photo, it's a plastic bollard. Next slide. Kristen, I can share those results. I don't know if you want to do that now. Yeah, that'd be great. Too, too deep. Okay. Well, I'm glad to see we have some answers kind of across the board. Um, and and let me also add that on Facebook, we have a couple individuals who indicated that they're part of the interested but concerned group. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I don't know if you like hearing that you're part of the majority, but you are. And uh, this, I hope, is a very exciting presentation because we're talking about how to make sure streets feel more comfortable to you. So I'm glad to see there are kind of some, you know, some of you listening in that are in that category. Um, so this is a facility that typically does feel more comfortable to that interested in but, con but concerned user group. Um, and it should be used on busier streets with more traffic and um, approaching higher speeds. Next slide. And then bike lanes, typical sort of more traditional bike lanes are a um, four to six foot area that is designated for cyclists and separated from motor vehicles only by paint. Um, and I'm sure you've seen these around town. Some of them do have a buffer where it gives you a little more separated, separation from motor vehicles. Um, and these should be used on kind of like that medium, medium traffic and medium yeah. type streets. Next slide. And then another type of facility is um, a shared lane marking or Shero, which is that little uh, symbol that you see in the, in the, on the street there. And those can be great directional and wayfinding tools. Um, but they don't really add a lot of protection to a street. So they should be used on streets with extremely low volumes and extremely low speeds. Um, something similar to what you're seeing in this picture, like a, a neighborhood street where there's really not a lot of traffic. Uh, next slide. 
And then uh, I just wanted to pull up this map and also pull up another poll to ask you a little bit more about where you bike. Um, so this question is for those on Facebook, if you want to answer in the chat there, um, where do you like riding most in the city? And I know this is not an exhaustive list. Um, and if you click other, I might call on you to ask. Um, but uh, the categories that I chose uh, are trails in the Rocky River Reservation, um, other trails, sort of those slow residential streets like we were sh showing in the picture um, in a business district. And then I said all along the lake and then other. So we'll give you a minute to make your selection. And again, those of you who are on watching us through the County Planning Facebook page, uh, you can uh, give your answers uh, within the comment section. Um, those options again, question being, where do you like riding most in, in the city? So options being the trails in the Rocky River Reservation, um, other trails in and around uh, residential streets, as Kristen was saying, kind of those uh, slower ones that she was talking about, uh, business districts along the lake or other. With an understanding that other may, may raise more questions than <laughs> instead of you asking of us. <laughs> this is a non-exhaustive list, clearly. <laughs> but it just, as we're walking through some of these recommendations, it gives us an idea of you know, what people are thinking. Um, as those come in, feel free to start moving through the, um, we can pull up that poll as we move through the network options. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually gonna hand it back over to Arthur to walk through some of our network options. Yes, yes, thank you, Kristen. So um, just as we, uh, just as you're continuing to do that poll, um, so now we want to get into, um, you know, based on the survey information, uh, based on the information that Kristen was sharing about um, the different types of, of infrastructure, different types of facilities that are available. Uh, we just want to kind of walk you through uh, our thought pattern as we got to the recommendations for the alternative network and then the ultimate recommendation. So um, just starting at our base, looking at our, at our study area here, uh, one of the first things obviously we did is, is understanding what is currently out there uh, right now. What is the existing bicycle infrastructure? So we're talking about uh, all-purpose trails. We're talking about the existing bike lanes, uh, talking about existing shared use lanes. Um, so we're talking about the trails uh, that are in uh, Valley Parkway, um, the, the connection up to Rock Cliff uh, Drive, uh, the buffered bike lanes uh, along the portion of Clifton Boulevard, um, the shared use lane uh, that's along Detroit, and then the bike lanes on Madison uh, Avenue as well. Now, just as important as the existing infrastructure, we wanna also layer uh, what is the plan and proposed uh, infrastructure uh, that's out there? So these additional lines that you are seeing on your screen in orange are indicating exactly that. What are the planned and proposed bicycle infrastructure improvements? Um, so with those, we're talking about Riverside. Um, we're talking about uh, Hilliard, a potential bike lane within the Lakewood section, a uh, cycle track option potentially within the Rocky River section, talking about West Clifton Road, talking about potential of an all-purpose trail on Wooster Road, um, talking about uh, Detroit Road, the remaining part of an all-purpose trail plus uh, a bicycle boulevard, and then as we talk about Lake Road, uh, the potential for uh, a cycle track. So again, as we start layering these pieces together, what's the existing infrastructure that's out there right now? What is the planned and the proposed infrastructure um, that is out there? And then also understanding what are some of the existing projects that are ongoing here uh, within our study area uh, that we can build off of, that we can um, um, utilize uh, as we're looking at this network. So the two projects we wanted to highlight was the Detroit Road uh, reconstruction project and then the Hilliard Boulevard Bridge re rehabilitation. So these are the things that we were taking into account uh, as it relates to the existing conditions, understanding the existing network as it exists today, understanding the network as it's being planned and proposed uh, in the future, and then understanding what are uh, the critical projects or the critical construction projects that are ongoing. And so here on this slide, and I'm going to welcome Kristen to, to join me uh, in this section, what we took from, from those two pieces, so, so we took what understanding the existing conditions, understanding the plan and proposed uh, network, um, the existing projects, and then the results uh, that we heard from um, the surveying and through the first virtual workshop and through the wayfinding survey, all of those get kind of thrown into the blender together here, um, and we kind of bring out what we feel are, are the priority projects, uh, the key recommendations uh, to kind of complete this network and how do we begin piecing that together. Um, so I'll kind of quickly go through that and then Kristen's gonna kind of break uh, some of these down for us. So 
As it relates to looking at full corridors or, or segments of a corridor, the three areas that we're looking at is the Clifton Boulevard and Lake Road section, which we'll get into here in a bit, uh, Riverside Drive, and then the Detroit Road uh, bridge portion. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about some of the urban design interventions later in this presentation. Uh, but again, for the corridors, it's Clifton Boulevard and Lake, Riverside Drive, and then Detroit Road. And then the other interventions we were looking at um, and recommendations were in terms of uh, the intersections. Um, so smaller segments, awesome patterns. So we were looking at Clifton Boulevard and Lake Road, Riverside Drive and Garber Drive, uh, the Wooster Road, Hilliard Boulevard, and, and, and Rockcliffe um, area. Uh, it's kind of more than an intersection over there. It's kind of a, a planned area. Uh, the Valley Parkway Trail Crossing. Again, we'll, we'll kind of hit on that uh, during the urban design interventions. And then uh, finally, Hilliard Boulevard and Riverside Drive intersection. Kristen, was there anything you wanted to add while we're on this slide before we jump to the next one? Um, just also the other thing that we thought about when sort of selecting areas to focus, you know, because not everything can be done at, at once and we really want to make sure that we end up with some things that can be, you know, implemented at the publication of this plan. Um, were the goals of connecting neighborhoods and connecting to the park. Those were two things that really came up in um, the surveys and in discussions with the um, uh, project team. So some of those, so like thinking about the um, Clifton and Lake Road and the Rockcliffe entrance, just thinking about um, making those connections into the park more accessible. That's a good point. Thank you, Kristen, for bringing that up. Um, so I'll, I'll toss it back over to you as we look at some of these alternatives for the specific sections here. Yes. Um, so I hope many on the, people on the phone have tried out the um, separated bike lanes on Clifton Boulevard. Um, we wanted to look at, I know they, they start and stop um, with, you know, within the neighborhood. And we wanted to look at, you know, ways of, of really building on that installation and building on that change, because I know it was an enormous change to the road. Um, one thing we noticed when we did, you know, as our steering committee did the field audit, is that there's, I shouldn't say one thing we noticed, because it's quite clear, but that photo at the top is actually a picture of a stroller with a little, a child's head in it. And there's no sidewalks um, and there's really no, you know, there's no safe way to kind of walk in this area. So that was one of the things that we noticed as we went through the um, walk audit. And then we also noticed um, just how hard it is to get back to the kind of um, ground level street network on the west side of the bridge. So once you get across the bridge, um, you know, the, the bike lanes do stop when, you, when the bridge starts. And also, if you, you know, travel in the lane on a bicycle across the bridge, um, it's hard to get back down to kind of the level of Detroit Road and Lake Road. So we looked at a couple of options um, to improve this. And um, you could also look at this as kind of a phase one and phase two. So we're, um, you know, we're mid-project. We're really looking for your feedback on what you think in general, what you think is important, and also which options you like. Um, so we wanted to, you know, there is a long-term project involving these interchanges um, that is, you know, going to be very expensive, and I know it's, a, it's pretty far in the future, but we wanted to look at some options that would make kind of getting from the bridge back to the level of um, Lake Road and Detroit Road a bit easier in the meantime. Um, so we looked at, you know, the first, the first thing we looked at is just narrowing the lanes on the bridge, so continuing that same cross-section where there's bike lanes on both sides of the street going in different directions um, with some separation. That's the image that you see on the top. And they continue across the bridge, and then we kind of fit them into the existing grades that um, follow around to connect you to Lake Road. Um, and then the second option that we are thinking about is really looking at uh, removing a lane on the bridge and removing a lane as you move into Lake Road. So this is a much more substantial option. Maybe it is more of a phase one and phase two, um, but it would allow us to think about a sidewalk on um, more of a sidewalk condition on a portion of Clifton Road um, on the east side uh, where we saw that picture. So we're kind of looking at I would say, you know, knowing that this interchange project is coming up, we were looking at what those 
what we could do in the meantime. So those mid sort of middle timeline projects um, to really make biking a little more connected and accessible in the city. Um, so the goal here was to continue the bike lanes across the bridge and connect to Lake Road. Uh, next slide. One of our other focus projects that um, when you when we looked at the um, feedback that came in through the digital survey, there were a ton of comments on Riverside Drive. Um, and it's also one that came up in discussions with the project team over time. Um, so, you know, some of the, uh, we can understand why it's such a great street to bike on. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and so we wanted to look at actually installing bicycle facilities on Riverside Drive. So Riverside Drive does have a sidewalk, um, but we wanted to look at bike facilities. So we, we thought we knew kind of where we wanted the bike facilities to be, east side versus west side of the street. Um, but some of the benefits that we saw to each are um, the west side really gives you the views of the park. It preserves, it pre preserves parking in front of people's homes. Um, and the sort of downside, the con, is that you have to actually cross Riverside Drive every time you want to get into a bike facility. So that's kind of the downside. But um, the east side does have easier access to the neighborhoods, uh, but it would require parking removal or at least moving parking across the street. So someone's got to cross the street. Um, and it has a lot of conflict. So if we install a bike facility on the west side, you're really looking at a, at a smooth ride where you wouldn't be, you know, battling with vehicles trying to turn right across the bike facility um, and other conflicts. Um, and it also doesn't get you the great views of the park. So because of these, and feel free to give us comments on these, um, we are really looking at a bike facility on the west side of the street. So this is kind of what that looks like. Um, and this is option one and option two, but it also could be seen as sort of phase one and phase two. Um, so, you know, narrowing the travel lanes and installing a two-way bike facility on the um, west side of the street. So it would be, it would also, I think, narrow the parking lane a little bit as well. So it's low cost. Um, and then we did discuss a possible phase two option that could be a great separated facility. Um, and could also possibly be a multi-use path. So it could get um, pedestrian access on that side of the street as well. So the next kind of focus area, and I feel like these are, we're jumping around a bit on the map, so I hope you guys are familiar and following. Um, but we, you know, thinking a little bit more about providing access to the park, um, we wanted to look at the Rock Cliff entrance to the park. That was something that came up in the you know, project team discussions, in our walk audit. Um, there are proposals for bike facilities on, um, in the Rocky River master plan, there's proposals for bike facilities um, on Wooster. There's also a proposal for a trail and road diet on Hilliard Boulevard. Um, so we thought focusing on this area and really showing how all of those things could come together and connect to Hilliard, or Rock, the Rockcliffe Drive entrance um, a little bit better would be, you know, a good place to concentrate our time. So what you're seeing here is a, a new trail on Wooster coming south um, that would transition into some into kind of a shared sidewalk, a wide sidewalk condition. It does get a little narrow between uh, Wooster and Rockcliffe um, that would transition it into a completed connection on Rockcliffe Drive that connects to the existing trail. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention with this, we know these are big projects and they might take a while to implement. Um, and something we'd include in the plan is a way to look at the Rockcliffe Drive entrance right away. Um, and an indication of that is just maybe thinking about a raised crosswalk um, across Rockcliffe Drive that uh, really makes it so that, you know, if you do cross Rockcliffe Drive, you, at least you do at a very slow speed. Um, and it really sort of designates that place as a so bicycle and pedestrian priority entrance. Next slide. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it back to Arthur to discuss um, some of the urban design interventions. And I realize this is a lot of information for everyone, so appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Kristen. So, so just two more sections um, uh, to go here as we're, as we're talking about this. So when, when we're talking about the urban design interventions, we're trying to, again, layer on uh, the pieces that we were talking about before. Uh, with respect to uh, looking at the corridor, looking at or looking at the, the corridor segment segments, excuse me, um, and looking at uh, the intersections, um, but we also felt that there were opportunities to really celebrate, to really 
uh, welcome you within, um, can you guys still see my screen? Okay. All right. On the Facebook live feed, it doesn't show my screen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly just stop share really quick and reshare just to make sure we're good. <clears throat> okay, now we're back up. There we go. Technology, you love it. Um, so when we're looking at the urban design interventions, we kind of identified again through through the survey results, both through the wayfinding um, and, and, and the Google form survey results, that there are a few areas that, that really should be should be highlighted. What can we do in those those areas? So looking at the bridges, obviously we have a, a, a nice uh, a nice or or a difficult in some cases um, topography difference. You know, being higher up uh, within the city of Rocky River and within the city of Lakewood, uh, and then the the reservation um, going down to to Rocky River. Uh, so there's opportunities with with the bridges, for example, to really uh, greet individuals coming through. Um, and an opportunity to really celebrate uh, the cities uh, coming through as well. One of the other pieces we want to look at um, is, is the bridges, um, um, the, the bridges themselves. Um, oftentimes these bridges are very utilitarian, very hard, uh, concrete, uh, and we thought of ways, how can we soften that up? How can we make that crossing across the bridge uh, a little bit more inviting, um, not just for, for cars, but also for pedestrians, for cyclists, uh, and for users who are coming you know, from Lakewood to Rocky River, Rocky River to Lakewood, vice versa, and then also coming down into the Rocky River Reservation. Um, so there's opportunities to really humanize uh, these bridges and these spaces. And there's also the opportunity uh, to celebrate the entrances um, to these spaces and, and, and coming across, uh, both from the standpoint of uh, celebrating coming in uh, into Lakewood, celebrating coming into Rocky River, uh, and then also the celebration of coming into uh, the, the Rocky River Reservation and, and creating, um, creating this line of, of entering you in and bringing you into the reservation and back out of the reservation. The last thing that we were thinking about too, just as we were talking about celebrating uh, the bridges and, and really uh, enhancing those connections is embracing the views that you see from these bridges, uh, both down into the reservation, seeing, seeing uh, the Rocky River, um, and then also looking back into the cities of Rocky River uh, and the city of Lakewood. So uh, there's opportunities uh, to do that here as well. So again, um, just like with the priority recommendations and the priority uh, corridors and segments, um, based on the feedback we heard uh, and really looking at everything, we really kind of honed in on, on this portion uh, of the study area uh, that really allows us to, to create some interventions, um, uh, both for the city of Rocky River, for the city of Lakewood, and then the procession into the Rocky River Reservation. Uh, so just for a point of reference, we're looking here to the north is, is Detroit Road, uh, into Detroit Avenue, uh, the Valley Parkway coming into uh, the Rocky River Reservation, and then uh, over here to the west, Wooster Road. Um, so the things that we are going to begin to kind of look into a little bit more and, and want to get your feedback on is uh, the first piece is really looking at this kind of City of Lakewood, uh, Cleveland Metro Parks Gateway, uh, this intersection building on the work that's already going on right now building on this intersection and how the procession down into uh, the reservation uh, to create a, a welcoming feeling. Um, and then also looking at the Detroit Road Bridge, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Again, um, looking at ways to humanizing that bridge crossing uh, and really invite people uh, across it. The other piece, and we had mentioned this before, one of the comments that we had heard uh, from the survey was with the Valley Parkway and the crossing uh, with the trail over here. So one of the things we want to do with that urban design intervention is really heighten that crossing, make people uh, and users aware that the crossing is there. Uh, when you see that crossing now, it's a little faded, uh, it's a little hard to, to see, so we really want to elevate that to improve the safety uh, of that crossing over there. And then the other piece that we want to look at um, is, is, as we were talking about uh, developing those overlooks, is, is looking at an overlook over off of uh, Wooster Road. Um, this is building on, on the master plan uh, for the city of Rocky River, uh, where this area was, was called to, to potentially look for a potential overlook. Um, so we want to look at how we can uh, build on that master plan and, and develop an overlook, which really allows you to look into the reservation, look into uh, Rocky River, uh, and really celebrate uh, the history and heritage over there. This next piece, uh, as I was talking about before, just kind of a little bit of preview of, of ways that we can um, not only improve um, the, uh, the infrastructure in terms of uh, creating uh, facilities uh, for bicyclists um, as well as pedestrians, but how we can really humanize and, and make that a, a kind of a welcoming bridge uh, in this area. So creating that extension, 
uh, creating uh, that space uh, that allows you to kind of uh, breathe a little bit more and feel a little bit more comfortable making that crossing uh, across the bridge. Um, and it also provides opportunity uh, for, for education as well. Again, we're talking about these great views back into uh, the reservation, back into Rocky River, uh, and looking and looking out into the, the, the cityscapes on, on both sides. Um, so this is an opportunity that we can create educational pieces uh, to, uh, to speak to that and to celebrate that uh, along this bridge section. So last but certainly not least, uh, I want to bring it back over to Kathy to talk about uh, some of the wayfinding and signage analysis uh, based on the survey results and, and some of the recommendations uh, in coordination of what you've heard thus far. You can go ahead and advance. So what's interesting about this study area, you know, we are talking about multiple modes of travel. We're talking about different types of facilities. We are talking about two different communities and a park system. So there's a lot of information <laughs> and a lot of things that people need to know and understand if they are looking to um, use these, uh, you know, a different type of in infrastructure, a different type of way to navigate between these communities. Um, and we also have to always um, understand that there might be new people coming and experiencing these areas as well. And we always want to welcome those who are the least familiar. And that is where wayfinding and signage can come into play. But because we are looking at two different communities and a park system and different facilities, um, we really have to analyze the context of uh, these areas to understand how wayfinding and signage can um, support what we're trying to do with new infrastructure, with accommodations. The idea is not to put signage everywhere because um, that can also be confusing. And we also know that when we're talking about these type of bike facilities, you know, especially ones that are interfacing, um, you know, even if it's just bike and pedestrian or if it's bike, pedestrian and vehicles, uh, there is a level of safety that has to be met and there's signage related to that as well for how people are instructed to use um, these facilities. So the wayfinding analysis we did is we always start with identifying travel paths. Um, and actually one of the questions in the wayfinding uh, survey and also when we surveyed and talked to the stakeholders within um, the study area, we asked about destinations, we mapped those out, um, it just so happens that the way these are mapped out are similar to the routes and roads that um, all the entire team has been looking at. And once you map those out, you can also begin to understand where people need to make decisions about what they do. And so really our focus comes down to looking at those areas of decision to understand what type of information we need to present to people um, based on the context of what they're seeing and where they are and what the recommendations that are being made um, from an infrastructure perspective um, will be in place. So. Uh, Arthur, I'm just going to have you go through these because it is pretty detailed <laughs> and we go into each of these and talk about what we're seeing in the existing um, infrastructure and really the intent is as we move through these recommendations, these are going to be overlaid with what we're seeing from the rest of the team in terms of recommendations for those infrastructure changes. And when we put that all together, then we can really think about how signage and wayfinding can enhance the experience for people who are, are choosing to experience um, your cities and your neighborhoods from this perspective. And then the last piece that we did, so I, as I mentioned, we're talking about two different cities. <laughs> we're talking about the information that people know, need to know to um, travel safely um, in this manner. And um, we're also talking about um, regional systems that are in place. So we know that there's already existing signage infrastructure that is either planned or in place in a lot of these areas. So the other challenge we have is to understand what, are, what is the nomenclature that is out there? What is the, the different um, information that people are going to be interfacing with at that time? And how can we um, allow each of these communities and each of these assets to 
maintain their own character and identity, but still bring consistency to how people travel in and around the area. So this is just a study of areas of use where you could expect to see certain types of signage or, or signage that might lean towards one community or one type of um, information system versus another. Uh, so very quickly here, um, we, we, we've thrown a lot of information uh, out at you. Um, uh, and we realize that there's, there's a lot uh, that's there. There's a lot to kind of take in and, and, and to understand. So um, we appreciate you um, kind of staying with us to, to really get into this. Um, just as a kind of, you know, wanting to address kind of, kind of the next steps here. Um, and, and while we're doing this, again, those of you who are on the webinar, uh, we have uh, several questions being submitted to us uh, through the Q&A and through the chat function. So please continue to do that um, as we're kind of wrapping things up here. And again, those of you who are watching uh, through our Facebook Live simulcasts on the County Planning webpage, um, please uh, submit your questions uh, and comments to us in the comment section just below uh, the Facebook Live feed uh, while we wrap things up here. So as we, as we move forward here, um, you are going to have uh, time. We're going to uh, have the, the video recording uh, of this webinar up on the uh, County Planning Project website uh, to give opportunities for those, of, of those individuals who weren't able to join us to kind of hear us walk through uh, the presentation. We know we had this presentation up for uh, about a week beforehand and allowed individuals to view it, download it, uh, and share their comments with us. But now uh, you'll have the opportunity to hear the project team uh, speak uh, to the slides that you were able to, to see. Um, so that'll be up on the project website uh, for an additional week uh, for additional comments. Um, so uh, there's still be time for, for those of you who are joining with us and maybe those of you, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to the future folks who are joining us who are watching this video recording uh, sometime in the future uh, to still interact with us and to submit your uh, questions and comments to us. Um, but as we move forward, um, our next steps will be to kind of take in uh, the responses that we're hearing uh, this evening and that we hear over the next, uh, this past week and over this next week uh, and begin to, to draw those in together with uh, the analyses that, that the team members have conducted uh, and begin to build our, our recommendations and implementation plan uh, as we move forward here. So uh, we really wanna make sure that we take in everything um, and, and make sure we understand the different perspectives and then take that in with the analysis and, and work with our project team. Um, before we, uh, I, I kick it over to, uh, to all of you who are out there joining us on the webinar and on Facebook Live, um, again, I just want to remind you, um, the county um, project website, uh, if you go to www.countyplanning.us slash projects slash community dash confluence, um, that is where you will see uh, the presentation is up there. You can click through the slideshow. You can download a PDF version of it. Um, this video of, of this recording of us going through it and hearing the questions and answers uh, will also be uh, posted on there. And then you'll be able to share or submit your questions, share your comments with us. Uh, through uh, the Q&A function that will be on the website. So very, very much plenty of time to, to interact and, and reach back out to us uh, with everything. So with that, having said all that, it's time to go back uh, to all of you who are on the webinar and on, on Facebook Live. So uh, to start uh, beginning to address some of the questions uh, that have been uh, submitted to us. Um, and so I am going to uh, present some of these questions to our teammates, to, to Kristen and Kathy. Um, and uh, maybe before I do that too, I, I want to give the opportunity, um, uh, Rich, uh, Jim, uh, Melissa, David, uh, uh, who joined us um, after we kind of did the introductions. Uh, thank you, David, for joining us. Uh, I just wanted to give you all the opportunity if, if you wanted to, and Kelly, I'm sorry, Kelly, you, you moved on my screen uh, over there. Um, uh, the, if, if anyone had any additional comments you wanted to, to add uh, to the discussion before we get into the specific Q and A's um, based on the presentation that you saw. Everyone's, everyone's good? That's good? That's fine? Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, so let's go dive into the questions. So we, we have questions that were submitted to us uh, while we were talking. Thank you again for, for all of you who submitted those. And then we have a, a few questions that were submitted to us through the website uh, from, from this past week. Um, so I am just going to go with the first one here. Uh, and this one was from Andrea. Um, so Andrea indicated that she often bikes through Rocky River and Lakewood. Detroit and Sloan, uh, where Black, Blackbird Bakery is in the entrance to me Metro Parks, seems like kind of a mess. Uh, what is the point of the stubbly white barriers that are lining each of the corners? 
Uh, they are an eyesore and don't seem to have much uh, of a purpose over there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that question out there. Uh, I know David's over there. I know, I know Kristen uh, as well. Um, anyone have a, want to respond to that directly? I can, uh, I guess I'll take a stab at it initially because I, uh, I mean, those, uh, the barriers, the bollards, I think <laughs> if that's what she's uh, referring to, we're, we're part of a kind of a pilot, a public art pilot um, to take a look at those, uh, just having those curb extensions, what would they look like? How would traffic adapt to that? And so it was, it was part of an initial pilot to, to adjust that intersection to better inform the planning that's now going on for the Detroit Sloan streetscape project uh, that we're doing. So those are not a long-term item. Um, they will be removed as, uh, as part of this uh, update to the streetscape, which is, is a separate project that's going through uh, city review right now uh, for eventual implementation. So just temporary. And I think too, we had talked about, you know, kind of that, that area um, just with, with the infrastructure in general. Um, I know Kristen, we had some conversations about that of just trying to, again, making sure that uh, those improvements um, are there thinking about how that flows, you know, from um, the road infrastructure across the bridge, so on and so forth. And even as we're looking at um, just as important as that, that Detroit Sloan um, connection, but now that Detroit Riverside potential connection um, based on how that uh, intersection would work with the proposed infrastructure that we're talking about um, along Riverside um, being kind of an important piece as well, looking at that. So I think David, to your point, um, you are all looking at that as part of that existing project that we had talked about before uh, with that intersection and then trying to line that up with um, some of the recommendations that we're hearing from, uh, from the uh, residents and, and the analysis that we're doing right now. I will just, I, and I forgot to mention earlier, so that the Detroit Sloan project is actually being, uh, it's a communication this month to our architectural board of review. Uh, and so there is an opportunity for for public comment and, and to take a look at that plan of the, where the Detroit Sloan, Sloan project is that at the public meeting next Thursday night, uh, there's information on that on the city's website, city of Lakewood's website under the architectural board of review. You can get more information on that meeting, even look at the agenda and look at the, uh, the current plan for that. So I would invite folks to take a look at that if they're interested for more information. Oh, thank you, David, for that. That's, that's good information. Um, one of the other, I think, kind of questions and, and comments, and, and I think this might be, um, Kristen, something that maybe we can talk about a little bit more, and I'm going to slide to that slide, was um, the recommendations, as my computer slowly moves us here, um, over here by, by Booster Road. Um, so we're talking about kind of this, this intersection of, of finishing Rock Cliff, um, Booster Road, uh, Hilliard Boulevard. Um, so... Um, there was, there was kind of a question slash comment of just kind of how it feels currently right now, very uncomfortable for a cyclist to kind of maneuver there. Um, this is a key intersect or a key entrance into the Rocky River Reservation um, for residents for the, the city of Rocky River, because uh, you can get in from, from Rock Cliff Drive. Um, so maybe, um, I know we were kind of going quickly through, through things before, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this uh, proposed concept plan. Um, and, and some of the specifics just to kind of highlight that piece given the comment about the safety concerns over here. Yeah, we, you know, when we started this project and we were looking at kind of, there's a, an enormous amount of planning work surrounding this project area in Rocky River, in the Cleveland Metro Parks, um, in Lakewood. And uh, there, there are a lot of proposed projects that are already that are already out there, the network's already out there. And one thing that I feel like is in our task is really just kind of looking at how they'll fit together and also combining them into a, a map that really thinks more about how these communities and this park connect. Um, and so this is one of those examples where there was a recommendation for, you know, a road diet on Hilliard in one document, uh, Wooster Road in another document and improving the Rockcliffe Drive entrance was recommended in another document. So this is kind of a, a confluence of many, many um, uh, project initiatives, which is, I think, pretty cool. Um, I will say that one of, you know, these are big projects, the Road Diet on Hilliard and the 
trail um, and bicycle facility on Wooster. There are, uh, are pretty big projects. And if um, people from those, you know, initiatives kind of want to talk a little bit more about that background, that'd be great. But um, one thing I really do want to look at, and we're going to urge kind of our engineer who's working on this to look at is thinking about uh, improvements that we can make in the interim. Um, and maybe it is that shared sidewalk, raised crosswalk, and com completed connection. So at least if you get to this entrance, you can find your way into the park. And uh, with Kathy's awesome wayfinding recommendations, you can, uh, you know, find your way into that trail um, where pe most people feel much more comfortable biking. Um, so if you have any, you know, specific questions about um, the intersection, I, I am proposing some area, we are proposing right now some areas of shared conditions. I know there was a comment in the chat about a, a dislike of trails and shared conditions. I, I do totally understand that. Um, sometimes there's not a lot of room on the street and, um, you know, bicyclists do have to move slower. And I think as we get more types of bicyclists on our street, um, hopefully we'll also have more bike lanes and there will be places where everyone fits in. People who want to move slower, people that move at the speed of a, you know, a, you know biking with a kid. Um, and moving at a very slow speed. Uh, so as we build more bike infrastructure, I do believe there will be more places for every type of cyclist to fit in. But this is a place where, um, you know, based on the turning needs and the width of the road, we might need a short section of a, a shared sidewalk, a wider shared sidewalk. Um, and I will also say all of these recommendations, we were kind of focused on things that we thought could be like reasonably implemented without road reconstruction or new signals. Um, there are some poles on Wooster Road uh, that are kind of, some of them are sitting on the right, you know, the street side of the sidewalk, some of them are sitting on the um, property line side of the sidewalk. So we are, we are kind of assuming with this project, working within existing conditions um, a little bit so that we can get some of these projects in um, without, you know, without kind of a major overhaul of the street. So does that answer, I know there were a couple of questions, some in the chat about, um, multi-use paths and also some in the uh, question and answer section, but does that answer your questions a little bit? Uh, no, I think it did. And actually, Rich, I was going to bring you on too to maybe yeah. talk about this a little bit more. Okay, yeah, and, and, and as Kristen brought up, this is, this is a, a confluence of a lot of different projects here. So, um, you know, there's a, a, a couple big projects and, and you know, Kristen also brought up the, the possibility to do some interim projects to make some, some more short-term improvements there. Um, our master plan in Rocky River does talk about, you know, addressing uh, Hilliard Boulevard with a, a road diet. And we have done some preliminary engineering on that to try to figure it out. And, and, it, and it would be great to incorporate that with the improvements to the Hilliard Road Bridge. Um, you know, that that corridor down there can be fantastic. So if we were able to uh, do a rate a road diet, drop it down to uh, a one lane each direction with a center turn, and then bring that bring that bike lane up into um, out of the out of the roadway in within the right of way, um, it would be a great improvement. Um, so that's something we've started to look at. Um, obviously, that's a very very significant project there. Um, you know, we've looked at the uh, extending that that multi-use trail on Rockcliff, um, you know, there's only a few houses there. Tough thing is the utilities are on the south side of the street there, so we would have to probably relocate those. Um, but you know, that's not unreasonable based on the amount of right of way that's available. And then even something as simple as the raised crosswalk there, you know, because that would really flow some of that vehicular traffic down in that area. There's a ton of traffic in in that intersection there um, and it, it places a little bit more uh, importance upon the pedestrians when crossing that street so that's one thing that raised crosswalks are great about so you know some of those things we could do more short term potentially um, and some things are, are, are definitely more of a grandiose plan um, but are still possible and you know that that Wooster intersection there is tough and with the presence of Ferris Steakhouse and Joe's there you know, we're really limited uh, on that east side to probably a shared sidewalk, but there is significant right away there to make improvements to it, to make it a little bit safer and, and dress it up a little bit and make it a little better for pedestrians also. 
No, thank, thank you, Rich, for, for elaborating on that. The other piece I wanted to highlight, and Kristen, you started talking about this, and I, and I wanted to bring Kathy um, and, and maybe even Kelly into the fold with this, is, like you said, this, the signage and wayfinding, you know, especially with, um, you know, Rich, as you were talking about kind of the, the, the complexities um, that there is right now with the current configuration, um, and even with the proposed configuration, you know, from understanding, you know, you, you have a, a specific group of individuals who are used to a certain flow, Right, and you kind of disrupt that flow, and 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 disrupt that flow in, in a major way, as you were talking about, Rich. I mean, these would be kind of major improvements that we're talking about over here. The importance of the signage of the wayfinding um, really stand out here to make sure that everyone knows where they need to be. And I think that also um, goes to even with improving. We were talking about this in, in one of our team meetings. Even with improving that connection. Um, at Rockcliffe Drive to, to connect individuals down into the Rocky River Reservation there, you know, because, you know, sometimes that entrance uh, is, is not as widely known uh, to a certain degree of what we have found out, that signage and wayfinding, Kathy, is just as critical uh, in these places to make sure the users know where they need to go and what options are available to them. Well, I, I think it's it, it's twofold. Uh, when you're making major changes like this, one, it, they need instructionally to know what they can and cannot do, what they're allowed to do, and how they interface with um, different types of traffic. And then there's the other piece of um, helping them understand what is available to them. And, and recently, we've been working um, actually with the county and the city of Cleveland, and we've been piloting um, a program of signage for off-road trails. Um, it hasn't really been applied to any other type of facility yet, um, but we know that off-road trails often interface with other facilities, so there has to be continuity in how that information is presented. And it's, it's in areas like this where there's a high concentration of available amenities and things to do and places to go that they need more information than strictly what can I do on this road? Especially if you want, if you're using your bike facilities or your um, bike and ped pedestrian facilities to help people experience your neighborhoods in different ways. So that's really where um, the wayfinding piece um, is really critical. But um, I think the challenge and everybody's talking about this is that we have, um, you know, we have different communities and we have different systems and right, especially at this point, we're interfacing with the Metro parks. And so there's a lot of things that we have to consider in terms of how that information is presented, but really the overall goal is to make sure that that information is presented in a consistent way um, across the entire study area. So people understand um, what they need to do and where they need to go, no matter what way they're coming in. Right, and, and, and Kelly, I mean, from, from the uh, Metro Parks perspective, I mean, as, as we look at the overall um, study area and even go a little bit further out, I mean, again, this, this Rockcliffe entrance is, is, a, is a critical link in, in connecting users into the reservation when we're looking at that, that area of the neighborhood, that area of the community there, right? Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think through all of this is that, you know, right now, it's kind of like a roundabout way, at least from a pedestrian, at least from a pedestrian and, uh, and cyclist perspective, right, that they would need to uh, gain access. And again, the access is there. It's just, it, it's got that last mile, not, not that it's a mile, but like that last mile to go to, to finish off that connection right there. Yeah, yeah. And I'd really give the consultant team kudos because I think what you've done is um, you've assembled a lot of different cues to the drivers and the bikes and pedestrians that this is a space for everybody. It's not just getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. It's about really being welcoming and, and having all these different user groups. So it's, I think that it's gonna make huge changes overall. And then the other thing is you're, you're really creating um, places along the way. You know, again, it's not just point A to point B, it's the experience. Um, I think the proposal for the Detroit Bridge is, is a fantastic example of that. What a great way to maximize an existing piece of infrastructure and the bridge almost becomes a destination in and of itself. So I'm excited about a lot of the proposals that, that we're talking about and I hope the community is excited too. Thank you, Kelly, appreciate that. 
Um, one of the other uh, questions that, that came up was uh, in regards to uh, Clifton Boulevard um, and looking at um, and looking at the options um, that are available here. Um, so, um, Kristen, I think I think I'm pulling you back in and potentially Rich as well as we're looking at this. Uh, and we've had a lot of lot of discussions with respect to um, these options and understanding what what we can do. Um, Kristen, as you talked about and Rich, you had touched on in the short term to really get that connection. And, and I'm gonna go up a couple of slides just to um, highlight here just for a moment, um, just that how that connection plays into um, obviously going through to get to the, the lakefront bikeway, um, the continuing through that lakefront bikeway, but also just that connection back into Lake Road, which then gets you into uh, the commercial district uh, for the city of Rocky River. Um, so then just kind of going back through those options, um, kind of Kristen and Rich maybe, um, just highlighting that a little bit more because I know we had a couple of questions of folks, you know, one versus the other and, and what are the benefits, um, you know, yeah. benefits of option one versus two and so on and so forth. Yeah. And just, just for framing, I know the question was about um, the suggestion of removing a lane. Uh, and so we, I, I know I mentioned this, but we were really looking at projects that could be implemented without, without a full roadway reconstruction. Um, so, you know, if, if this road was to ever have a larger project associated with it, um, you could really, you know, redefine the entire cross section. But we were kind of looking at projects that could be implemented within the existing cross section. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of those issues is that there actually isn't um, a sidewalk opportunity. So that's, that's kind of where option two came from. Um, but yes, you can fit... Uh, so this is a section of the bridge, but um, east of the bridge, there uh, is no sidewalk. That's the photo that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, so, so yeah, that's kind of where this uh, option came from. The other thing that we know we noted is that once you get to the west side of the bridge, it's really really hard to cross the street. So we really we wanted to look at an option that allowed people to connect back to the city grid kind of at the lower level where Lake Road and um, Detroit Road sit without having to cross without having to cross the street. I, uh, an uncontrolled crosswalk is not a good um, option for this location. So yeah. <laughs> so it's a little bit of why you know why we're proposing a road uh, an option that looks at a road diet. A full reconstruction could look at could look at that median, could look at the way that the um, sides of the road interacts. That would be a much uh, bigger project, clearly. So we were really looking within the existing dimensions of the roadbed. Yeah, and, and to just touch on, you know, kind of bring up this kind of short-term solution. Uh, so we have an ODOT urban paving grant that will repave these two marginals um, next year. So what we've done based on some of the wayfinding information from this project, um, you know, this was brought up, we've actually, we're gonna be incorporating into that project. So if you look, it's kind of hard to see in these maps, um, when you head westbound, there's a little cut through sidewalk that takes you and you have to actually cross over the marginal, head east, and then you have to cut back across the marginal to go south and the wayfinding you know that it doesn't when they were doing the wayfinding it doesn't really it, it's clumsy and it doesn't make sense and then as you continue south there's not really good pedestrian crossings or anything like that so what we're going to be doing is we're going to make it there's a short sidewalk section that we're actually going to be extending down all the way down to uh, its beach cliff or or lake road and so that way you won't have to cross over the marginal and we're also going to be pushing the crosswalk, the existing crosswalk right at Beach Cliff, closer to Beach Cliff. It's actually kind of set up the margin a little bit now um, to make it safer for pedestrians. It'll be better visibility to four uh, vehicles of pedestrians that are crossing that. So we're hoping to kind of do a short-term solution if we can incorporate some good signage there um, you know, to bring people to our old Detroit, our shopping district there. And then, um, so that will also make improvements to those two pedestrian crossings. Um, that way we're, we're make sure we are ADA compliant 
with everything with those pedestrian crossings. And then the goal also is to, um, we're going to be applying for a, a TLCI grant to improve the overall pedestrian crossings um, from this area to Detroit Road um, with, we're, we're talking about, you know, maybe um, there's no real access for the residents from Cleveland Yacht Club to get across the street either. So we're looking at potentially a, a mid-block crossing there too. So um, to really tie everything together and, and try to make improvements to make it safer all the way around. Oh, thank you, Rich. And, and there's also, uh, uh, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but there's a really good ice cream shop over there. In the <laughs> so any way that we can get better access to, to the great ice cream shop over there is completely on board with me personally. I think it's R R Rosso Gelato, some great, great stuff over there. Um, thank you, Rich. One of the uh, questions that we had, and, and I think Jim, um, I, I might bring you in the fold and, and Rich, you might be able to, to answer this as well. I'm gonna go to, over to that slide. Um, was talking about, if I'm understanding this correctly, and uh, Andrea was the one who's, who asked this question, um, talking about, I think, some of the planned and proposed um, infrastructure projects, and specifically about um, uh, Hilliard and Lake, um, Hilliard and Lake, yes, and Rocky River. And I think with respect to um, the proposed um, cycle tracks um, that we had talked about here, and I know uh, Jim, that the county planning department worked on the master plan for the city of, of Rocky River. Um, so just so that we were making sure we're addressing all, all the questions and comments. And, and obviously these planned and proposed projects, as Kristen was talking about before, um, uh, played a large role in understanding where those interventions, where our recommendations want to be so we can be on the existing studies. I wonder, Jim, if, if maybe you can comment and then Rich, if you wanted to add to it about uh, those proposals as part of of the master planning efforts, uh, specifically with Billiard and Lake, to her question. Sure. And one thing I'd, um, I'd start off with is that the Hilliard Road Bridge um, is going to be replaced. Um, I think we're looking at construction year 2023 uh, to start that. So it's, you know, the results of this study are going to be discussed with that. Uh, with the bridge design team so that we can integrate um, these two projects fully. So I would say that that portion is, is in the works right now. Okay, don't want to leave this to the sound of crickets. No, no, <laughs> no. I keep you forgetting that I mute myself. I should, I should know better. <laughs> Um, with respect to with res, um, so so thank you Jim with for for answering um, those. Um, one of the other questions, and um, this will be something that I can start talking to, um, and Kristen, I think from, from your perspective as well, was uh, from the website, was the Detroit Road Bridge um, and some of the inter urban design interventions, but also just kind of the, um, and I'm going to go over to that slide here. Um, here we are. And just the kind of the way to, to kind of, uh, as, as we've been kind of phrasing it, humanize uh, that space and that connection over. Um, so I guess for, for myself to kind of elaborate that to, to the question was, you know, with, while we, while we recognize that these, that these bridges are utilitarian in, in function, I mean, they're, they're still though to, to go across uh, the river and connect pedestrians uh, as well as um, um, cyclists. Um, and it's not just about the motorists um, and, and the buses as well. Um, so when we talk about humanizing this is we, we really want to make sure that that connection feels comfortable because just as that uh, bridge connection is, a, is an impasse uh, for, for cars, right? You know, you need that connection to get over from point A to point B. It's, you know, if that connection wasn't there, cars couldn't get across, same thing for, for pedestrians and cyclists. So we really want to make sure there's, a, there's an equitable distribution in terms of space uh, for each of those users when they're going across that bridge. Um, and it also offers an opportunity, and, and maybe Kathy, you can also uh, um, speak on this too, as an opportunity to be that gateway, right, for both the, the city of Lakewood, the city of Rocky River, and, and quite frankly, the metro parks. I mean, when we talk about this, this bridge area, it really is kind of the cross intersection of all three entities, right, coming to the space. And so, you know, Rich and David and others, I mean, you can speak to the kind of amount of traffic and movement that's going on around here. And so really, it's, it's really highlighting the importance of making sure that each of the users feels comfortable traversing this space 
feeling comfortable in this space uh, and, and, and can use it because it benefits all at, at the end of the day, because it's granting connections to, to Rocky River, to Lakewood, and to the metro parks. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that really struck me when we did the walk audit um, was the narrow sidewalks on Detroit Bridge and Clifton. And six feet might, six feet is enough space for a sidewalk if there's nothing else there. And if there's a, a sort of no need for a shy distance from either edge. And in this case, because you have the, um, the sort of barrier on one side and cars on the other, both of those things need kind of a shy distance. You can't walk, you know, directly up, a you know, up close to a barrier and, you, and it doesn't feel comfortable to walk, you know, right on the edge of a street where you might fall into traffic. Um, and some of the sort of information we collected from the walk audit and also just the photos that people sent us from around town, you know, everyone on the street is walking kind of in single file, even if they're, even if they're part of a group. Um, and I'm not going to say that it's, it's not that it's not accessible because it is, it's just not comfortable. It's not a place, you know, this is one of the most beautiful views connecting two business districts. It's a place where should people should feel accommodated and comfortable. And you can see it from every, you know, every photo I've seen of this bridge and um, from the walk audit, you can just see that people don't feel comfortable there. They're walking single file, they're protecting, you know, they're making sure they keep their arms in, they're protecting whatever they're carrying um, and they're, they don't feel comfortable. So I, I think, you know, one of the biggest things is really protecting that, widening that pedestrian space. Um, and of course the bike lane is great too. <laughs> but that was one of the things that just really, really struck me um, is that this connects two great spaces and it, and, and it can be this great um, as we're showing here. Um, and the capacity, the sort of roadway capacity, the vehicle capacity on either side, you know, is only two lanes. So, um, it, you know, it does narrow on both sides of this, the bridge. And, and I think you hit on a really good point there, Kristen, with the comparison of, you know, what the definition of accessible is versus having that space feel comfortable, right? So yeah. you can meet the standards that, that um, dictate that, that, the, that the space is deemed accessible, right, from, from, from any of the different standards, but how do we make sure that that space feels comfortable? And, and those are sometimes two different things, as you pointed out, the six feet is, is, is accessible, right, by, by definition, um, but as we look on the other side, if we were to have this, you know, uh, eight foot plus six, you know, this, you know, total 14 foot kind of pedestrian way, um, not only are we hitting the, the accessibility standpoint, but we're also greatly improving the comfort level of making this crossing uh, across the Detroit Road Bridge. So I think that's a really good point that you brought up of accessible versus um, comfortable, because that was um, another question. And I think you, I think, Kristen, you've kind of addressed it that we received from, from the website of, you know, um, some indications of, you know, spaces do feel uh, accessible technically, but we want to be able to feel more comfortable. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, have that six feet, yeah, someone can pass, but can two people really pass next to each other, right? Can mm -hmm. two people in a wheelchair really pass each other within that space? And uh, I'm sure as both, as both cities, uh, city representatives could, um, could admit to, you know, we want to see the, the commercial activity within those spaces increase. So you want to see that traffic increase, right? So as it increases, how do we ma maintain that comfort um, in addition to the accessibility standpoint? And then also, Arthur, the layering on top of that from an experience perspective is the fact that you have very exciting entry points. This is a placemaking opportunity for mm -hmm. both the cities and the metro parks in these areas. This is a very, it can be a very exciting corridor because of the opportunities that are available for people. And to see people on the streets and to see that type of activity um, is really what attracts everybody. So, um, you know, there's, there's the, you know, starting with first the level of comfort so people will wanna be on the street and then the level of um, enhancing the experience of understanding what is being offered to them. Um, within this area. Oh, that's, that's spot on, Kathy. Um, we have a couple more questions, both from the, um, from the website and what has been submitted to us and through Facebook Live. Um, but before we get to those, I want to take this moment again, just to remind and, and first of all, thank everyone who's joined us here uh, on the webinar and thank all of uh, those individuals who are joining us uh, through the County Planning uh, Facebook Live uh, feed. 
Uh, we really appreciate you uh, all being here. Um, again, uh, for those of you who are on the webinar, if you uh, want to submit a question uh, to us in relation to what you uh, have seen uh, through the recommendations, through the suggestions, uh, please feel free to do so uh, through the Q&A section or through the Q&A function, excuse me, or through the webinar chat. Um, for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live through the county, um, county planning Facebook page, uh, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. Um, you can submit your questions and comments in the comment section just below the video feed, um, either on your phone screen or tablet. Um, so, so with that, uh, again, a couple more questions. And, and uh, David, I want to get to a question uh, in regards to the city of Lakewood. But before I do that, because it's kind of keeping on the same, um, same subject uh, that we're talking about here, um, one of the questions that we, we had, and, and maybe we can provide some clarity to it is, or maybe not so much questions, but comments is uh, from the website was making sure that those uh, pedestrian, those sidewalk spaces um, are, are clean. Um, so what they were referring to is just the outdoor vendor displays, signage, outdoor dining, bike parking, right? All those amenities that we see within that uh, sidewalk space, that those are great amenities to have, but can we, um, uh, can we also make sure that, um, you know, there's space for um, uh, the pedestrians and everything to, to roll through? So I think that's important. Um, but then the other question was about, as we talk about some of these um, uh, trails um, and, and um, uh, bike infrastructure where we're near the valley, right? And maybe Kristen, you can, you can address this. Um, the question is, you know, would the pedestrians be offered a better view, you know, if they were closer to the bridge, right? In those conditions or to the valley versus further away, but closer to the cars. So the question is just like, it's just in, in your professional opinion, you know, what really is the greater, um, what, which one is the better situation? Um, you know, how do you kind of balance the safety aspect with also uh, the view sheds that you can see with respect to the infrastructure, the trails uh, along the valley. So I think spe uh, speaking specifically on the Riverside, uh, Riverside Drive conditions, and then even with some of the bridges. Yes. Um, yeah, we did think a lot about Riverside Drive um, because there are benefits to uh, a bike facility being on both sides or a multimodal path to being on both sides. Um, and ultimately we did uh, think that it was better to have the multimodal path or bike facility on the river side of Riverside Drive, uh, but the, uh, the park side, because although there, you know, there are safety sort of, there are safety issues with both conditions uh, with, the, with the path on the river side, yeah, I'm sorry, I should use west and east. The west side of Riverside Drive, um, everyone who enters that bike facility has to cross Riverside Drive. And most of those crossings currently are, you know, uncontrolled and unmarked. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a sort of safety factor that we thought about. However, putting the bike facility on the east side means that every, everyone who's biking has to cross driveways and intersections and car every car who's turning onto a street off of Riverside Drive would cross over that bike facility because there's no, you know, there's no roads on the other side. So uh, we did think it was a better condition to put the bike facility on the west side. Um, another thing that we've discussed, and I, this presentation is actually making me more um, sure in this uh, thought process, is just that you, uh, this study area has a lot of conditions where you have to cross two lanes of traffic to get into a bike facility. We see that on Valley Parkway. Um, we're proposing it on Riverside. It's being proposed on Wooster Street. So I think, you know, including that, including some design guidance for installing, you know, selecting locations for crosswalks and installing crosswalks in that type of condition, I think would be a good addition that we're going to include in the, um, in the plan. Because we see that in existing conditions, we heard a lot about getting, you know, accessing the park, the dog park, where you have to cross, cross two lanes of traffic in an uncontrolled location at a curve. Uh, but we see that throughout the study area. So I think some sort of general guidance for how to install a crosswalk and how to select a location and, um, you know, the kind of signage that ensures that cars are going slow enough as they approach a crosswalk to actually see someone who needs to use it. Uh, we can include some of that information in the plan in kind of a general sense. So as, as you improve crosswalks, like it can be implied at several locations, I think would be good. 
that's, the, a, that's, a like that's a good point, Kristen. Part, yeah, we did this. We have discussed that. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like there was a two-part question, and I might have only answered one part. No, I, the other part I think we've we've kind of talked about in terms okay. of the pedestrian amenities and just making sure there's clear distinction in terms of where those amenities are, such as signage, such as bike parking. Yes. Um, versus the, the clear path, you know, and I think we showed that on the bridge, of, yeah. you know, that amenity strip kind of, you know, being a little bit larger because we would talk about having seating and um, and, and uh, signage yeah. there versus having that clear, comfortable path um, as well. And I think it's important with, especially with this Riverside Drive, because if you remember, um, uh, those of you who are watching, when we talked before, Riverside Drive had the, the, the most comments uh, when we talked about the survey. Mm -hmm. Of, of having a lot of interest about wanting to see um, uh, some type of improved bike infrastructure along this drive. So clearly this was a, a highlighted need by the community and wanting to see uh, this connection happen here. Um, and Kristen, as you pointed out, you know, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to, you know, each side of this, uh, no pun intended, of, of, of where the infrastructure uh, would also be for this space. Um, and just ultimately coming to that conclusion of what provides um, you know, effectively the, the most safety really for, for users and, and comfort. All right, so um, David, you had your hand up and wanted to ask a live question here. So I'm gonna bring David into the fold. And then, uh, okay, so David, you are in. Um, and now I'm going to ask you to unmute so you can ask your question live here. So David, if you, you should be able to hear me. Um, yeah. um, you should be able to hear me. You should get a notification will ask you to unmute. Um, and then you should be able to ask your question live here. Okay, well, while we are, while well, I'm working with David through the, um, through the technical difficulties here. Um, Kristen did remind me uh, that we did not sh uh, share our last poll uh, that we put up. We were so excited about the poll and then we, we moved through the presentation. So um, while we're doing that, I'm going to share those results with everybody um, while I'm working with David to uh, get through our technical issues. Um, so uh, Kristen, while I'm working with David, would you be willing to kind of uh, walk us through the results there and maybe chat through it? Yes, I can do that. Um, it looks like I'm, I am a Glenn, glad to see everyone loves riding on all streets. Um, but <clears throat> the most, the question was, where do you like riding most in the city? And the most, the highest response was the trails in the Rocky River Reservation, which is great. I totally understand that. Um, the second two most uh, highest responses are other trails and residential streets, which is pretty exciting to see. Um, there were some responses on business districts, um, other people like to ride along the lake. And then there was a response of other, and I did see in the chat that that person clarified um, that they like riding on Valley Parkway, but not in the trail because the trail is usually too full of people. Um, so that is something that we have noted. I also live in a city that relies heavily on trails for a lot of um, the you know transportation commuting as well as other transportation and it can be congested and um, which is a great problem to have and we'll get you more trails. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. Um, but also make sure that, you know, we're not proposing trails everywhere, but only where they really work. There are some design guidelines around that. Oh, no, absolutely. Thank you. So I think we worked through the technical difficulties. David, can you, can you hear us? I think we can hear you now. Uh, yes. There we are, beautiful. David, go ahead and ask your, uh, ask your question. Um, I, I didn't really have a question. I just had a, a comment, like uh, great work uh, from you all. Um, I'm from the uh, neighborhood uh, that's actually part of Lakewood, but it's the West Park area, Narragansett, uh, Lakewood Heights, Niagara. Um, we're right next to the Metro Parks, but we have awful access. In fact, most of us go around over to Rockcliffe uh, to get in instead of go, you know, trying to go down the, the busy road on, on Hogsback. Um, but I just, I just think this is great. I just saw it the other day, so I signed up. 
um, and I'll make sure I communicate it to all the key people in the and the streets and the neighborhoods over here. No, we really appreciate that, David. And 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 since we have you on, and you talked about uh, something that we talked as a project team related to uh, the entrance into Hogsback, uh, the the Hogsback Lane entrance into the Metro yeah. versus the Rockcliffe. So since I have you on, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a question your way um, because I think it's beneficial <laughs> for all of us. So you talk about how you typically go around and go to the Rockcliffe entrance, right? I mean, what I guess can you yeah. maybe on that more just your your rationale your reasoning as to why you feel more comfortable um that way versus going uh, hogs back into the reservation uh just because rock cliff has the separated path okay um you know so and whereas on hogs back you're you're in the middle of the road and you got it's mostly a cut through i don't think people are really visiting the park <laughs> i i think they're they're you know cutting through they're going to 480 they're going somewhere else um, actually, I wish the Metro Parks would just close it up again and just use it as pedestrian bicycle access. It doesn't seem like it's really needed for car access. Um, plus, it, it seems like it's uh, kind of falling over again. There's a big crack in the, in the middle of the, the road again. They keep patching it, and then it keeps coming back. But um, I guess they get more complaints from the you know car drivers than, than anybody else, unfortunately. No, no, David, I appreciate it. that's really, um, that's good. That's good insight. Um, I saw as, as you were talking about the, the conditions over there at Hogsback. And I think it's really good information for, for us as we can, as we can uh, pick up as, as much as possible, because that, again, that discussion of, of Hogsback and, and Rockcliffe and, and understanding uh, those key connections into uh, the reservation and understanding just as, as users, as, as community members, you know, how, and you know, what, what the importance of those connections are, right? What what feels right. comfortable to you uh, in order to use? Well, and, that, and that's why I always stress it's it's more important as a, from the health aspect, you know, just getting outside, getting some physical activity, um, you know, is much more important than just being able to, you know, cut through somewhere faster in a car. No, absolutely. I, I don't disagree with you. And Kelly's shaking her, everyone's shaking the head like, yeah, <laughs> get it. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, yeah, sure. The comments and, and the question. Um, one of the other questions, um, and David, I'm looking to um, I'm looking to you um, that we received was uh, from one of our attendees, just talking about um, how impressed they were uh, with some of the new bike lanes and bike boxes um, that have been um, installed through through Lakewood. Um, and so the question, and this may or may not be a, a fair a fair question uh, for yourself, um, but um, we can start with you is. Just what has been, um, well, the first part was how the project, how those projects were funded. Um, but the second part was the, the feedback from motorists and residents um, with respect to the newer bike lanes and the bike boxes that have been um, installed here in Lakewood. Uh, well, I think I, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't start by thanking the county because I think the, the county had the, the lion's share to, to, for the funding in terms of uh, the, Lake, the Lake Avenue striping. It really came through, uh, and and then again for our uh, um, our projected uh, project for Hilliard Avenue, which is next in the bin coming up here. Uh, we were working on the county to get funding for that as well. So we're extremely grateful because it does make these projects a lot easier uh, in terms of the implementation piece of following through with the intent uh, to get bike lanes um, in there. I think with any project like this, I mean you, everyone. It's probably no surprise that there is a there is an adjustment period uh, for people, um, and, and despite all the efforts that my predecessor Alex Harnett's put into kind of shepherding that the the restriping through, I think it was three community meetings over about a year and a half, a full traffic study, um, and everything. You still you still have the you know it, that it's uh, just. The adjustment to the you know the the loss of parking on the south side, um, and then kind of the just the just the adjustments of the new travel lanes, the new routing, and, and and I was really glad and happy to see that we were able to get you know a new element for Lakewood in those the intersection boxes uh, put in on some of the key intersections that we have. Um, and so that in and of itself is a new element that people have to, you know, have to learn how to drive and behave and, and, and even, and so we, we were really grateful to Bike Lakewood and Bike, and, uh, which is kind of our little local 
uh, chapter of Bike Cleveland, that they've been putting together some education and, and uh, outreach, you know, a video and some other things that go out to tell people what those boxes are all about, how you use them as a cyclist, how you interact with them. And, and we developed uh, and, and some products as well on our website to help kind of educate people uh, on the new, the, those features, but it is an adjustment. Um, and we, so we've been fielding some, uh, I guess it's just some additional comments on concerns for people trying to cut, you know, cut through on other routes of Edgewater to avoid the new striping. Uh, we're working out an issue at the Cove intersection right now in terms of new signaling. Um, and so it's all those kinds of like secondary adjustments of once the project gets going, those things uh, uh, of adjusting to all those kind of little issue points that do pop up. And so, but it, I think it, it has been uh, largely to the credit of my predecessor. It's been an ex a great success of going in there and we're seeing the use uh, and we're collecting data on, on usage uh, to inform future projects. So, um, yeah. No, that's good information. Uh, thank you, David. Jim, do you have anything you wanted to, to add or anything to that? You don't have to. I just like, as, as Kathy knows, I like putting people on the spot to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave's got it all. Uh, it great, great information. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there's uh, a couple more questions here that I want to make sure we get to. So we have about 10 minutes remaining. So again, those of you who are with us on the Zoom webinar, um, you know, uh, still submit your questions into us uh, if you have any additional questions. Those of you who are watching on, on Facebook Live, thank you again uh, through the County Planning Facebook page. Um, you can uh, submit your questions or, or comments in the comment section uh, just below the video, so, so please do so um, if you have any. Um, I just wanna make sure that we've uh, addressed all of the questions we also received on the um, project website, um, as those of you had the, um, were able to view the, the presentation uh, beforehand. Um, and I believe that we've answered this, and, and Chris, I'm going to bring you back into the fold here, and I'll also um, uh, adjust our, our slides, but um, I believe we talked about this with respect to the Clifton Bridge um, and just the, um, just the street section. Um, there was talk about, you know, do we need to have the median? Does the median have to be there? Could you eliminate that to kind of ease the allocation of space and, and maintenance over there? And I think we've, I think we've hit on it, but I thought that maybe we, you could maybe elaborate that a little bit further. Um, and then they also had a question relating to, uh, as we talked about the urban design interventions um, that were uh, suggested, um, a potential intervention there at the Clifton Bridge, which I can address, but um, Kristen, I'll, I'll scoot over to that slide, but maybe talking a little bit more about um, that cross section on Clifton and, and options, um, both in the near term, uh, which we really are focused on right now as, as Rich and yourself are talking about, and then maybe more long-term uh, suggestions. Yes, so the question was about the median specifically. That, that is one yes. we didn't yes. look at um, yes. touching, and I can definitely you know, talk to the project team about the, that median a little bit further, but in my experience with bridges, <laughs> um, usually it's, it's pretty hard to remove a median. <laughs> without actually doing a pretty major undertaking. So we didn't consider removing the median, but I will talk to my project team and see what they, you know, know about, you know, maybe it is, I'm, I'm assuming it's assuming cast pretty deeply into the bridge. <laughs> so um, I promised to look into that, but we, we did assume that it was immovable. Um, and then the other question was about um, turn lanes. That was the question in the chat. Yes, I think that was the question in the chat uh, for this. I think you're yeah, you were combining a lot of questions, which is awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there was uh, a question about turn lanes. Um, that is, you're specifically asking about the West Clifton entrance. That is outside of, this section is at the bridge itself. So that is um, outside of this section. And we, you know, any proposal with a road diet would need to be studied more. Um, and particularly turning movements, for me, the biggest concern with a, any reduced capacity is those turning movements because that means it actually causes a, a safety issue if a lot of cars are sort of stopping in a, in a lane to make a left turn. Um, so, you know, in places where there were enough turns to need a turn lane, that would have to be worked into the design. Um, and then I don't know if that covered all the questions. No, in your it, 
No, it did. There, there's a question I have to ask, ask of myself in regards yeah. to design intervention, but I think I'd be remiss to not indicate as we've been saying, you know, when we've been looking at these recommendations, again, building the existing infrastructure that's in place right now, uh, building on the proposed and planned infrastructure, looking at those existing projects as both Rich and, and David had talked about uh, before um, in, in their dialogue, we really were looking at those interventions, those recommendations where we can see some near-term implementation. Um, there's yeah. some situations that we're, that we're talking about here uh, that might be a little bit more long-term and, and trying to line those other projects that are coming down the line. Um, but the project team and, and all the partners really felt like, how can we capitalize on the existing uh, projects that are ongoing, that, the mm -hmm. that is going in the different pieces. And, and we really feel that these recommendations that we're looking at highlighting those, those opportunities here. Um, so that's why, you know, maybe some of the other sections, yeah, there, there could be some things that we could look at in terms of the segment or in terms of, of the intersection, but what is really gonna have that, that high impact uh, with the implementation, right? And we feel that these interventions, looking at the corridors and segments that we talked about up on the screen right now, and then looking at the specific intersections and those crossings would really have the largest impact to really improve um, not only the, the accessibility, but the comfort, as we talked about, and the connectivity of all of these uh, segments together. Again, connecting the neighborhoods, uh, connecting the cities, the cities of Lakewood and the cities of Rocky River, and also connecting into the Metro Park. So we really wanted to highlight how we can connect everyone together within these spaces. So then to, I have to ask myself the, the question that I, that I just stated. So the question was in regards to uh, to Clifton Boulevard, if that offers an opportunity for a uh, lookout piece. Um, and to answer that individual, absolutely. Um, uh, great to, to look at the type of intervention that you see here in some of the examples. Um, even, you know, it could be something in, as we're talking about the future of, of, that, of that segment, if we're actually looking at playing with that, that bridge deck and what we can do on that space, doing something similar here that we've talked about with, with the Detroit Road Bridge, right? Um, but again, as we're looking at this, we, we are going to continue to highlight that as part of the report and the study that this is an area where we can really maximize uh, the overlook uh, opportunity here. Um, those overlooks, while, while we focused in this kind of center area of Wooster Road, a Valley Parkway, Detroit Road, um, kind of this uh, intersection of Rocky River, Lakewood, and the Metro Parks, um, the recommendations uh, for overlooks um, and overpasses such as this for, for Clifton and even Hilliard are still going to remain as part of the report. Again, we feel like the synergy uh, now is kind of centered in this area that the existing projects that are going on, we can build on that momentum, build off of um, the, the initiatives that are ongoing to really enhance uh, this. The urban design interventions, again, looking at that Lakewood uh, Metro Parks uh, connection right there in, off of the road in the Valley Parkway. Uh, looking across the Detroit Road Bridge, um, working to develop uh, an overlook option um, in Rocky River off of Wooster Road. Um, and then as um, Kristen, I think you were talking before, really looking at a couple of interventions here, um, both with signage and, and design that we can enhance uh, those. I think this is also kind of a microcosm of the other spaces that we're talking about. You know, while we're highlighting in this presentation some very specific recommendations, um, and Kathy, you mentioned this before, uh, as well as, uh, as Kelly, um, these interventions can also play out in, in the other spaces that we're talking about, right? Um, so these can, while they're not exactly like to like the, the symbology and the principles can remain the same in the other spaces of improving those connections, really making uh, users aware of the spaces and what spaces are, they, they need to be in. Um, it's just like when we talked about the Wooster uh, intersection down there with Hilliard and Rockcliffe and really making sure that all the users understand uh, where they need to be and how they can move through those spaces. So I do not see any additional questions and we're coming up here to our last couple of minutes. So um, I'm going to uh, ask our panelists if, if anyone has any, any final uh, comments um, or uh, elements, uh, things that they wanna say before we sign off. But before I do that, so I'm gonna allow everyone to kind of get all their comments together and maybe even raise their hand if they want to comment. I just want to remind everybody um, before you go, and again, you can visit our project website, countyplanning.us slash project slash community dash confluence. On the project website, 
Um, you're going to see the presentation that we showed uh, tonight. It's up there actually right now. Uh, you can view the presentation. You can download the presentation. Um, you can submit your comments uh, in the presentation or, or to the presentation as well. We're going to be uploading uh, the recording of this video. Um, so if, uh, if someone you know uh, was unable to attend uh, or wasn't watching through Facebook Live, not a problem. Um, just let them know that this will be up on the project website. It'll also live uh, on the county planning Facebook page uh, through the recording. Uh, so you'll have the opportunity to hear us uh, talk through uh, the presentation uh, and maybe some of the questions that, that you might have might be answered uh, in what we have uh, spoke about tonight. And again, you will still have the opportunity to comment uh, on the, um, the presentation, on the recommendations we're talking about through the project website. So really want to make sure everyone real, uh, knows project website, countyplanning.us slash project slash confluence for all the information uh, related to the project in this virtual workshop. Um, so with that, um, anybody uh, want to offer some final comments before we sign off here? Well, Arthur, I couldn't give a better plug for county planning than you just did. So thank you for that. Welcome. Um, really want to thank everybody for the really thoughtful conversation. Uh, this, this has been a great session. Um, and I would like to say about our website, even after this project concludes, um, the project web page will still be around. You can still get information on the project. So um, it doesn't go away. This is, this is Go ahead, Kristen. I, I have a short comment just, um, you know, in this time when we're all meeting digitally and having to have these public meetings digitally, I think, um, I know David, who made a comment, mentioned sharing this with your neighbors. I think that's so much, you know, it's even more important right now. So if you can share the project website and the video um, with coworkers, maybe people who aren't your neighbors too, coworkers, and just help us expand that network because it is a little bit harder. Um, easier in some ways and harder in other ways to reach people. So um, yeah, in this, in this great social experiment, do uh, share this with your coworkers and neighbors. No, absolutely, Kristen, well said, yes. Like, like we said, this video, we, we want this video to live to, to really begin to um, kind of walk you through the presentation. We realize that sometimes it's difficult to just look at a presentation kind of cold uh, and understand all, all the nuances. Um, so we're hopeful that um, by all of us, the, the members of the project team being able to kind of walk you through the presentation. This begins to address any concerns or questions you may have. And, and then the dialogue that we had afterwards um, hopefully addresses some of the questions and concerns. Um, but if it does not, um, you can submit those questions uh, and comments uh, to the project team through um, the county planning uh, project website. Uh, and we'll be um, gathering all that feedback um, and then reaching back out to you uh, with our, our final recommendations. So. Um, I want to thank all of our, our panelists uh, for joining, uh, Jim, David, Rich, Kelly, um, our project uh, team members, uh, Kathy and Kristen for joining us, as well as Marguerite, who was in the background taking vigorous notes for us. We really appreciate um, all of you joining. Um, we appreciate all of you who joined us here on the webinar, uh, and we greatly appreciate all of you uh, who joined uh, with us uh, on the Facebook Live through the County Planning Facebook page. Uh, for those of you who watched us after the live session, thank you for watching. Uh, again, submit your comments and questions to us uh, through the project website, uh, and we look forward to continue building uh, this great project and, and delivering um, some fantastic recommendations um, and look to have them implemented in the near future here. So thank you all very much. Uh, everyone have a, have a great night. Thank you. See you, Jim.